speakers here, welcome. Um, again, my name is Martha Curie Lidu, and I'm here with Sara Ann Murphy, who is coordinator of assessment at Ohio State University, Jeremy Bueller, who is the assessment librarian at the University of British Columbia, Rachel Llewellyn, who is the assessment librarian at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and uh, myself. And uh, here's a slide. I'll come back to this slide. Uh, uh, so you have at least a visual of, of our faces as we uh, we all engage into this, uh, what I hope to be a discussion. Um, we do um, have a large group of people attending, so we will ask you to submit your questions through the chat box. So t please type your questions. We have received some questions already. Uh, and um, in addition to covering those questions, uh, uh, Sarah um, did a little bit um, uh, more of a, of a slide deck for us uh, based on some of the, of the questions we received in her session. Uh, I hope uh, all of you attending have watched uh, the three webcasts. Uh, that each one of our individual presenters uh, did, showing how they are using Tableau. Uh, Jeremy, Sarah, and Rachel, have, have you watched the other two people's webcast? Yes. Uh, indeed. Indeed. Any, any questions? Let's start with uh, asking you if you have any questions of the others. Rachel, anything oh, you want? <laughs> I, I've had the pleasure of, of talking to and working with Jeremy and Sarah all along, so they've had lots of questions from me, but I don't know if I have any right now. That's fine. And anyone else uh, wants to venture with uh, or has something wants to ask from each other before we go to what our participants have offered to us? Sarah? Um, I don't have any questions right now. And Jeremy? No questions. I was just uh, delighted to see that uh, what I already knew of both Sarah and Rachel's work has developed even further as uh, as the presentations show. So that's great. Wonder wonderful. Yeah, the three of you have been working together for a long time. The, the, the way um, I became more familiar with uh, your work is uh, through the panel you did at the Library Assessment Conference uh, in Seattle uh, last August. And uh, of course, this work is evolving as your experience with Tableau is evolving. Um, and we are now having a growing community, I hope. Um, as we were preparing for these webcasts, I wanted to remind of a resource, everybody, of a resource that Rachel made, um, made me aware of. Uh, it was um, a, an article uh, that appeared uh, the Gardner Report. Uh, it was the February 2015 Gardner Report, and it appeared right before our webcast series was starting. It's a report on business intelligence and analytics platforms, and it does have this chart there um, with uh, data they collect on the different analytics platforms, um, sort of grouping them into um, um, into this quadrant based on two dimensions, the ability to execute and their completeness of the vision of that analytics platform. And you can see on the top right quadrant there, you have the leaders in this field, in the business intelligence and um, analytics software field. And there are a number of software uh, packages there, companies, uh, Beyond Tableau, SAS, and SAP, and IBM is there, and Oracle is there, MicroStrategy, Microsoft, uh, uh, what's that, Click, uh, Quick. Um, and, but Tableau it is, is sort of a little bit of an outlier up there in terms of the ability to execute, the ability to deploy it quickly. And uh, the report does conclude that this is sort of the gold standard. And that's what sort of led um, our uh, webcast series uh, to, to focus um, on, on this product. But there are other products out there. So some of the questions we have received already from um, 
our participants, um, has to do with the cost and the pricing models uh, that you can um, you can deploy and pay. And uh, we're fortunate because we have different uh, uh, pricing uh, models amongst the three of you. Rachel, would you like to tell us a little bit more how your pricing model works for you? How many? Uh, how much does it cost? How many people have access? Sure. Um, and I would encourage folks who are interested in, you know, checking more uh, specifically in terms of a quote with their rep, and they can contact Tableau, and they'll get their sort of academic region rep, who will be really helpful sorting that out. Um, I, in fact, I spoke with our rep, Adam Putter, this afternoon. So um, we have we have so we have, they have academic pricing. So we have desktop professional, which is. 1500 the first year, so 1500 your first year, with a 300 annual maintenance fee. We now have two copies of that. So we have two staff members, myself and Jessica Adamick, who have the Desktop Professional, uh, which is sort of the authoring tool. You can get um, Tableau Personal for 750 and that's a 150 annual fee, um, which just lets you work with flat files, and you can only publish to the public um, server. So you can't save those uh, locally. So that's one of the differences between the personal and the professional. So we have the professional because it lets us connect to database, multiple data sources, the database connections, and that's something that personal doesn't do either. Those are just flat files. So we have two copies of that, two people doing authoring. We publish uh, much of our data to the free public server so that anyone can look at it, and there's no fee for that. But we also have our own library version of server, which we run on our hardware. And that's um, 700. And so there are multiple ways of setting up the sort of the server licenses. So really, this shouldn't limit how people think about it. But the minimum server configuration is for 10 licenses, and it's 750 per login. And that's on your own equipment. And there's $150 ongoing annual cost with that. So you can also subscribe to Tableau Online, which is their cloud server where they host it. It's their hardware. And I think that's 500 per user per year. So that wasn't even, I'm not even sure that was an option when we purchased the server here in our library, but that's sort of the altern alternate choice. And then there's a large sort of institutional six-figure implementation that um, is really for the whole institution or for systems, um, which are priced and configured separately, but significantly more expensive. And um, we do have institutional implementation yeah. uh, in, in this group, right, Jeremy? And is that? I, your um, tableau. That's um, uh, that's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. In that UBC has an institutional uh, license. Um, it's still we're still on the fence. In that the library hasn't yet committed to uh, participating in that because there's a cost sharing uh, component, and we're still weighing the the benefits of of going that route. Um, from what I can see, that seems to make sense. Um, but I'm afraid I can't discuss the. Um, the costing model for that, other than to uh, echo what Rachel said, that, that it ends up, you know, if that's distributed across an entire campus, that may be a more affordable option, but you're definitely dealing in, in overall with a, a much, much higher um, subscription cost. Um, in our, I'll just extend from there and talk a little bit about where we are right now with uh, Tableau implementation at UBC Library. It's very similar to what Rachel described. Um, we have, uh, I believe it's now three Tableau Desktop Professional licenses. And I have found that for um, those of us, there, there are a few in the library who use tools like, or formerly use tools like uh, Excel or other uh, data presentation tools quite heavily. Um, Tableau Desktop Professional has been 
a worthwhile investment in its own right just in order to support our own work, never mind the, the publishing possibilities, and then using Tableau Public where possible. And uh, if we do commit as a library to being part of the institutional nation of Tableau, then the Tableau server is obviously a bonus for distributing that. But even on the data analysis side, I think um, Tableau Desktop Professional may be worth considering on its own, even if you can't afford server. Very good. And Sarah, how is the setup uh, at Ohio State? Um, well, at Ohio State, I, um, I am the only individual with a desktop server, I'm sorry, desktop professional license. Um, I actually started with Tableau Desktop Personal. Um, that was $750 um, with a $150 annual maintenance fee. And the nice thing about the annual maintenance fee is it inc includes all um, upgrades to the next version of Tableau. And it seems that since I've had Tableau, it, it upgrades to a new version almost every year. Um, I was able, when I had Tab Tableau Desktop Personal, to save my own files. Um, but I now have a Tableau Desktop Professional so that I can interact with more than just Excel files and access files. I can connect directly to um, data sources such as Google Analytics, um, anything with an ODBC connection, et cetera. And so that is uh, 1500 a year. And I have been able to share desktop, uh, share um, dashboards and workbooks um, using what's called um, the packaged workbook option in Tableau Desktop Professional. This allows you to extract all of your data, and then um, you then share it in this um, alternative file format. And then anyone in our institution um, can open that file with the free Tableau Reader. And so what we do is we um, we um, up, I upload files, Tableau workbook file, Tableau package workbook files to like our our cloud environment if it's appropriate. Um, we use Box here on campus. Um, and um, people can then download them onto their PC and open the file from their desktop. Or mm -hmm. if it's something that needs to um, be on our internal servers, we'll just share it in a shared server space. And all they have, to, as long as I have extracted all the files and placed everything in the one folder, um, they can open it from their desktop with Tableau Reader. So we have uh, made a conscious decision right now not to pursue Tableau Server. Um, uh, mainly because um, of the cost involved with um, having to pay for each individual login and the minimum 10 licenses. It just wasn't cost um, effective for us at this time. Yeah, Nancy Turner, actually, you, you answered the question, her question because she was asking, is it necessary to have the server in the library? Uh, so in, you, you can imagine a scenario where the server is in the institution and you share that server with some other unit or department, right? Oh, I would love to have server. I would love to have yeah. server because then you can embed your visuals on websites but keep your data private. I can't mm -hmm. do that right now. I can mm -hmm. embed visuals. I can embed dashboards on websites, but I, it, it has to be publicly available data. So I have mm -hmm. some interactive dashboards already on a couple of our library's websites. Um, but it's all publicly available data, so I'm not worried about that. But I would like the ability to present some data sets, but yet n not have to share the data that's driving that data set with others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And are there any other units on campus, you think, that may be using Tableau and uh, could potentially in the future be collaborators? Um, we have a pretty active, well, we're starting to um, have a pretty active um, Tableau users group here on campus, and mm -hmm. um, we're finding more and more people every month who are interested in using Tableau, and um, we're trying to bring everyone together to um, you know, learn from each other, and also uh, we're having this new feature where um, you can bring a dashboard you're having trouble with um, making it work the way you want it to work, and you can crowdsource how to fix it. and. That's mm -hmm. been really, really helpful. So we also have a very active um, users group, Tableau users group, just in the Columbus greater metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. So like, I think I went to the first meeting years ago, and it, like a couple years ago, and there were like 
we fit around one table, and now now they're pretty big. The meetings, so that's interesting. And I like to go to the the um, citywide meetings just because um, I get ideas on how to do how to put things, how to put dashboards together. It it, it jogs my thinking. It makes me helps my creative creative ju juice get my creative juice flowing. Yeah. Um, Melissa is asking, yeah, if uh, Rachel, would you please repeat the cost of the server, the number of licenses, and the maintenance fees? Okay. So the minimum, if you have your own server hosted locally, you provide the hardware. A minimum of ten licenses are required. That's the sort of base baseline, or ten licenses. It's seven hundred and fifty per login, and that's perpetual license, so that's a one-time cost. But, and that includes your 150 <coughs> annual fee for the first year. So you, you pay 150 times 10 ongoing for a minimum of 10 licenses to start with. You can buy more, too. And I think if you get high enough, there may be other pricing, but that's sort of the baseline pricing. Rachel, it's, it's Jeremy here just with a question about this. When you talk about logins for this, um, am I uh, correct in understanding that this is in addition to your desktop professional? So you're, you have your authoring platforms, that's that other pricing model you described, and then the logins are just um, authenticated access to whatever it is that you publish on server. Is that correct? Um, I think I followed you correctly. I, have, I use up one of my server licenses because so I have to have one too. It's, mm -hmm. They're not in addition to the they're, so they're separate. So is it still possible with this setup that you can publish um, data on the server that is accessible to anyone who has the link and does not need a login? Or is everything in this model behind a login and using one of your 10 logins? Everything in this model is behind the server and requires one of the 10 Logins and they're, um, I think, set up. They're intended to be uh, individual logins, so not like the reference department login. It's for a person in the reference department. So it can change if somebody leaves. You can transfer that license to somebody else, but it's not meant to be a generic license. It's meant to be a named license, um, which is why we end up publishing a lot to public because we have more people than more than 10 people that we need to access our data so we have to keep track of what we're good sharing publicly versus what we need to keep on the server this in in many ways is a big challenge with data right you know what do you um, release at what level uh, and um, there are different levels of disclosure, and, and clearly that has implications on the Tableau licenses. Um, but someone, Sheehan Brannon actually is asking a very interesting and provocative question. Has anybody considered making Tableau available for student use on library computers? Their GIS librarian is, is considering this. Um, have you thought of Tableau as a service for the student uh, community? We just added Tableau Public to um, one of our the, the build in one of our computer labs, but at Ohio State we are not. Um, we just haven't. I mean, we did that mainly so that we could have a, a class in that room but um, we haven't really started promoting it as a service here right now at this time. The at, UBC, at UBC Library, we haven't, um, we haven't considered that, and I, I appreciate the question. Um, Tableau Public seems like a viable way of doing that, of, of adding that into a build. Uh, I do know also that Tableau provides free desktop licenses for students, or at least has until recently. Um, and I don't know whether there an arrangement could be made with them in a, in a lab setting to have the more um, fully fledged Tableau installed on Yeah, I the asked desktop. about that, and the answer was no. So that is okay. why I put Tableau Public on the machines 
in that one, and it's only in one room in our in one of our library computer labs right now. And that was because I w I was teaching a class for librarians <laughs> in there. So it's there if anybody wants to use it, but we haven't really told anyone that it's there yet. I don't know if there's anyone um, who's from the University of Washington who might be able to chime in, but I think I remember reading that they were a school that did an institutional license, and part of that was with all students having free access, that there were, I think they were building in that kind of student support for youth as well as for publishing. So I was really interested to read about that at the time. But I don't, I'm not really sure of the details. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a little hard to um, figure out uh, who might be from the University of Washington if there is one attending. Uh, but if there is one who has actually logged in from um, with the web interface and they can do the voice through the web interface, uh, you can raise your hand and um, um, we will be more easily identify you this way. If you have used the phone line, it's a little harder to identify which phone number corresponds to which name. So, um, or if there is, so if from any of the participants, um, who has this ability and would like to to raise uh, your hand if you have uh, logged in uh, through um, IP access and not through the phone, raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, I think um, uh, you know this this brings us nicely to the uh, second uh, set of questions we keep receiving about Tableau. Um, you know, how do you train people? Um, how much time does it take to learn it? Um, I know it's an exciting uh, piece of um, of um, software, but it does have a learning curve. And sorry, you did mention one of the reasons you installed uh, the software, the public Tableau uh, in the lab was to teach your colleagues uh, about how to use it. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit more about the learning curve and um, how, how much effort does it take to learn it? Right. Um, well, Tableau does offer a number of really good video tutorials on their website that you can watch when you're starting to interact with the um, software and learn how to use it. Um, I did find them a little challenging because uh, well, they were designed for individuals who are in the business community, and so it just took a little bit of um, translation of terms into um, what, or, or into how 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 um, you know thinking of everything was done in profit and revenue. So I just changed my thinking to think about usage and other things, so that the um, that the training would make a little more sense to me. And after a little bit of practice, that got a little better. But I've been using Tableau since spring of 2012 now. I will say that it's uh, pretty easy to make a, um, a, 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 a simple visualization right away. It's a little more challenging to make an elegant visualization. That takes a little time um, and a little bit of learning. And, um, and a really good interactive visualization with higher level filters. Um, I'm still learning about that. and. Um, I, I might be learning for quite some time um, because mm -hmm. I've got to um, learn how to do some calculations and other things first. But um, it really depends on what you you want to do, how you want to use the software, um, how much time you're able to put into it. Like anything, it gets easier the more you practice. It has yep. a bit of cadence, so as you use it more, you start to realize, oh, yes, I need to look for this on my marks card. I need to look for this item over here on um, my columns shelf. And you know, at first that makes no sense, and it sounds like I'm talking gibberish, but after a while it, it, does, it does work. Um, the reason we gave an instruction session here at OSU is because our data management librarian received feedback that our librarians were interested in learning more about um, data visualizations. So we teamed up and 
she took about 45 minutes of the program to talk about um, some data, data um, visualization tools, and then I took another 45 minutes to talk about Tableau because we've learned over time that data visualization means different things to different constituent populations, et cetera. So, um, but anyway, so um, we actually did this last week. There were only about seven people at the um, at the session, but um, we did download Tableau Public onto our machines in, in the computer lab, and it was part of the build. And the nice thing about having Tableau Public on the build was that um, I just put all of the files for this um, program up in a box, and every time um, one of my colleagues came into the room, we just added them to the box file, and then um, they could download the Tableau files that I provided and immediately open them on their on their machine, so that was nice. Um, but we did, um, I did create some job aids for them, and we walked through how to put together um, one dash, one type of dashboard. I think it was word clouds and text tables. So, thank you. How how about you, Rachel and Jeremy? How much time is is it taking you to feel that you're learning different elements? I'm uh, I'm never sure how to answer that question because in some ways it's like um, asking the question how long does it take to learn how to use Excel mm -hmm. um, as, as Rachel or sorry as Sarah pointed out for for basic things it can be quite um, quite efficient and quite quick where I have been investing some of my time lately is in learning about uh, calculated fields and and how to do more advanced things with a very limited data set so where in the past I might have added to an Excel spreadsheet and made new columns that have different calculations in them. All of this can be done off of the very basic um, raw data. And that kind of calculation um, certainly takes, uh, I would say, it, for me, it was uh, a couple months of getting familiar with uh, Tableau for other needs before I thought, okay, now I think I understand this well enough to go into the more advanced features. Um, but I do, I do think that um, for just getting a sense of how the software works. And as long as you're working with a data set that you're already familiar with, so there's no surprises in the data set itself, and you, you understand that, um, if you have a, a, you know, a limited objective of just creating a graph without interactive features uh, and publishing that, uh, that it's uh, certainly uh, doable within a couple of, of focused uh, one-hour sessions with the software. Um, I think the uh, I would agree with Sarah that the, the online help is really great at getting you started, um, but it, it really is the more you put into it, the more the more you'll get. Thank you, Rachel. I have a similar uh, reaction. It's pretty easy to get started with some straightforward views. Um, I'm a big fan of the bar charts. People have seen my little blue bars in many of my visualizations. They're pretty easy to do. They're pretty straightforward. So getting started with some straightforward data is really rewarding because you can do that pretty quickly. I also started in 2012, I think in the fall, and I went to a two-day training. Um, that, w that turned out to be really useful. It was two full days, and it really got me immersed in a whole set of things that I wasn't using immediately but had a little bit of context for how to go and get it as I had projects that called for those kinds of features. So whether it was filtering or customizing marks or how to label, doing some different things like that, that made it a lot easier, I think, having had that initial two-day training. I do look up regularly. I Google my answers you know, when I'm trying to do something, there's, there is great help online. And I've also been really um, grateful for their online support. So part of your $300 annual fee for your desktop professional comes with the ability to put in tickets and get help. And they will call you and talk to you about your ticket, which I just love. So not only is there sort of a very quick turnaround time in response to any email that you put in, but the, you can send data, they can work with things, they'll call and follow up if need be. So I found that really useful when we were trying to do some of the calculations that others mentioned that you know, I couldn't get them to work the way I was expecting and got really good support for that. So um, 
so yes, so I'm still learning. There's still things that I can't do, and I'm excited about learning more. Yeah. You know, so it's that mix between what you can get up and start doing right away, which is satisfying, um, but then there's always there is more to learn. Yeah. And just to, to give a little bit more diversity to this, um, we, we've been historically using SPSS in it here in the area of season. Of course, IBM SPSS now has a predictive analytics um, environment, so I ended up going to a half-day workshop to get a sense of what it does. You know, so I'm finding, yes, you know, with a few hours you get a sense of what uh, you can do but you do need to spend the time to work with your data. These uh, environments can be um, relatively simple to do something um, and get something quickly, but as you incorporate more data, you want to relate more sources, uh, it becomes uh, more complex, um, which um, brings us sort of to the the third question, the third item we're going to uh, discuss here before we go to the uh, detailed ODBC uh, demo that um, Sarah did for us. Um, people wanted to find out a little bit more about the interactivity uh, you can have with Tableau. Um, does it do interactive graphs? At what level uh, can you manipulate the data? And um, how do you deliver the data? So yes, 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 and yes <laughs> is, is my answer at Ohio State. Um, what I, I, and I think if I understand this correctly, I think that um, what we typically view as interactive graphs um, in the Tableau environment is being able to filter your data with your graphs. So um, Tableau has a function where you can um, set up a graph and, and um, like say a bar chart and you can, the default would be all of your data. You can add a filter for a particular field and when that filter is on, that allows you to um, select different data elements out of, out of that filter. I don't know if I'm explaining this right. So like say if um, st um, state, U.S. state was one of your filters, you could say I only want to look at the data for New York and Ohio and everything will automatically recalculate on all of your graphs um, with just the data for those two states, if that's what you're interested in. And so the sky's you know, the limit in what you can do with that. Um, there's also some nice features called action filters. And I, I've been, this is um, um, my, the thing that I've been having a lot of fun with lately. Um, and what that is, is you can create a dashboard and then you can add these uh, action filters which say when you click on this particular graph, it's going to, um, fil or, or if I'm going to click on this one particular filter, it's going to change the data for all of the graphs on my dashboard. Or if I click on this particular graph, it's going to open another graph on another page. You can click on a particular graph to open another window with a, a, a table with more data. You can click on something in, in, with an action filter that takes you to a website. You can embed a website. So I've seen a dance faculty member here at Ohio State who had this nice little interactive um, graph, but when you clicked on certain um, touring troops, it would open up a YouTube video within the dashboard window with um, a dance for that particular touring group. So there's, there's a lot of different things you can do to have interactivity um, with a Tableau dashboard. And a good person to um, look at, um, if you just Google Ryan Sleeper, S-L-E-E-P-E-R, I think. Um, th this is a gentleman who does a lot of um, work on Tableau Public with uh, sports data, and he has an incredible um, number of creative ways to um, package and share data, interactive data that's really engaging and compelling and tells a really good story. Wonderful. Um, Jeremy and Rachel, any comments on the interactivity elements? 
I'd, I'd start by just uh, agreeing with the yes, yes, yes statement from Sarah. Uh, I think it's the interactivity that makes Tableau as exciting and as viable as, uh, as it is for use here at UPC Library. I want to qualify what I said before. When we start talking about adding interactivity, um, certainly that very limited amount of training that I described to get started, uh, it takes more time to build that interactivity into it. Um, but as Sarah pointed out, the filters are a relatively easy way to get started with interactivity. And um, we've used that here at UBC Library to create kind of um, generic reports. Uh, so for example, for circulation that have a lot of underlying data. And we don't necessarily know how the end user is going to want to look at this, but we give them options to filter by item type and by location and by branch and by checkout range and by um, the shelving location, whatever the, the options may be. And essentially what we're doing is creating a space where they can kind of build their own reports using these, these interactive filters. And so um, with that method, it's not necessary for all of the end users to learn how to use Tableau. We just take advantage of um, the skills of a couple of publishers, um, a couple of people working with Tableau Desktop Professional to build in some of that flexibility so that a single report potentially answers a fairly wide range of questions. So I think um, the filters are definitely a, a powerful feature. There is one other aspect of interactivity that I've uh, been exploring recently, and that's by including parameters that the user, um, when they're looking at the, the dashboard online, they can type in their own parameters that then have an effect on the calculations uh, in the data that they see. I'll give you a quick example here. Here's an example also of where um, you don't necessarily want to make your data public. Um, but I've recently put together a dashboard uh, to help with the allocation of our budget for student employees. And so um, we have a spreadsheet that has the budget request, the amount requested from each of our units. Um, that's subdivided into, into various requests. So we're looking at uh, you know, probably 50 entries uh, altogether. And um, on the dashboard, you see a list of these. And then there's several parameters. One is the student budget itself in a given year. Um, so you can enter that. And another parameter is the percentage of the subsidy that we uh, may get from the university because there's a program that, that subsidizes some of the student wages. So you can type in a percentage there, for example. And in, in the example I used, I typed in a, a student budget amount, and then I just plugged in 70%. Um, and what it does is it calculates what, how far we would be over or under budget if all those requests were accepted and we got 70% of our request for the subsidized funding. Um, but you could look at that and say historically, well, we've actually gotten closer to 85% of the funding. And you can just, the user can type that in and have that calculate and, and essentially change all of the underlying calculations to show how far you would be above or below at 85%. So it can become a bit of a, a what if uh, planning tool and can help with some of the, um, some calculations that I think uh, would be pretty complex to try to do in a spreadsheet. And in this way, we can distribute it to a working group and have members of that working group plug in their different um, scenarios and, and see what happens. Wonderful. Rachel, any comments on this aspect? Well, the, uh, one aspect of interactivity that we use the most is working side by side at, at my desk with desktop professional. So there are a number of filters and interactive elements that we use for data we've published to public, like library or user group or loan type, different things like that that people can check and use those filters very easily themselves. But when they want to ask other questions, they can't do it on the unless that all of the interactivity is anticipated and built into the view, they can only do what's available and then what they have access to through that public interface. So there's even you know, the qu asking questions and interacting with the data will often happen at the desktop level, working one-on-one. -on -one. 
but we also this this may sound so plain, but I'll take a copy, I'll take a, either a snapshot or I'll take the image and I'll put it in an email or I'll send it to somebody or we'll put it up at a meeting without the interactivity. And in part, it's because it's difficult to get the kind of interactivity in a presentation setting or in a room where you're trying to convey more limited information. Um, and the limits of, of trying to share the information. So I think it does have great interactivity, but some of the, the deepest interactivity is happening at the desktop level. It seems like each one of you has have brought to the table different elements of, of how you can work interactively with Tableau. This is wonderful, excellent. Thank you. Um, so let's, uh, it did come up at one of the presentations. People wanted to find out a little bit more how uh, the o ODBC connection uh, uh, works uh, in Tableau. And uh, Sarah Murphy has created uh, a bit of a walkthrough. Sarah, can you take us? Uh, sure. Um, okay, let me get situated here. So Martha asked me to um, talk a little bit about how um, we connect to ILLiad using an ODBC connection. And this was in relation to some slides I shared at the um, first presentation or first webinar. Um, and here, here, here's one of them. We um, took a look at our ILLiad borrowing. And um, at Ohio State, our ILLiad um, department um, do not align directly with our university's um, academic departments. And um, our librarians are not necessarily, um, we might have like a, a biological sciences librarian, but that individual is assigned to seven different departments that are related to biological sciences. So um, we put together this um, visualization using a, a number of different sources um, that would allow us to uh, filter our borrowing requests based on um, our users' departments in a way that was meaningful to us. So we'll say history, and these are basically all of the history departments at OSU that are assigned to this one librarian. Um, so and then this was just another part of that visualization. So, um, so yeah, again, to create some of these um, visualizations, we're blending data from a number of different sources together to make them um, work and make sense and to create a richer visualization that's meaningful to our user population, or, which is our librarians. So anyway, um, so if you're within the Tableau desktop professional um, workbook, um, this is the page that you would see. And um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it, it does get easier the more that you use these um, this tool, um, you start to learn the cadence of um, Tableau and how these pages are set up. So for instance, right here we have a, um, a data card, and our dimensions card. This is where all of our categorical data will appear once I connect to the data. And our measures card, um, let me get the arrow right here, which is where all of the um, measurement data is going to show, the, the money, the usage data, anything that's a number is going to show there. Um, some of these right here, this is where you put out, this is your filter shelf. You can drag and drop dimensions and measures onto your filter shelf. The marks card is where you um, change how the appearance of um, th um, the data that you've dragged and dropped onto your um, dashboard and your worksheet visualization right here. But anyway, to connect to the data, um, I would just up here, um, click on connect to data. And then um, this window will open. And I would scroll to the bottom because I'm looking for um, the ODBC connection. It's always the very last one. Um, but up here shows that these are all these different kinds of data sources you can connect to directly um, using Tableau. And they add more every year. Um, once I click on that, I um, select from this DSN here, I select what um, I've named OSU link. Um, this just opens up my ODBC connection box that's on um, my my desktop PC. I connect. I have these are a couple other systems I connect to, but I connect to this and I say OK. Um, it's going to open another window where you type in your login information, just like you would normally if you were using Access. Um, and then um, 
I get to this window and I have to go through and find um, the OSU database, OSU data for us, some other institutions, I'm sure you know your own name, type in the database schema and then start finding the tables that I'd want. So I always start with the transactions table um, and then I move on and I connect the transactions table to the users table and right here we have, a, this is a basic Venn diagram with a inner join. Um, I need to con change that though to a left join and that means that all of the data in the transactions table will appear um, and only the data that's present in the users table will join to that transactions table. Um, I have to find the unique um, data element that's going to link these two data sets together. Um, and then let's see, next, because this is such a large database, I have to add a filter or I would, it, it would just crash on me. I would never get any data back. So I add, I click here on the add the filter up here on the right, sorry, up here. And then, um, keep clicking right here on add and I usually say NVTGC keeps OSU. The process type I just want to keep borrowing. I want to find all of the transactions that are marked request finished. And then this is the really important one. I have to limit my date range for what I'm pulling. So uh, the last time I went into this database I only looked for one year. Um, and then I say okay. And the last thing I think I need to do is um, I want to change the connection from live to an extract. I tend to mainly work with extracted data. You can refresh and extract it, a data extract at any time within t the Tableau workbook. Um, but this is um, going to improve my performance um, if I'm working on an extract rather than on a live connection. So I do that and it's going to ask me to save that extract to my PC and I'll say yes. Um, uh, after I, and then I'll hit update now, um, and then I'm going to hit go to worksheet, um, and all of these fields right here will populate with all of the data, and when I get to the worksheet, it looks like this is what I mean by I have to save my um, data source, my data extract, and then once I get to this page, now I have all of my data for the transactions table, which is right here and the users table right there. Um, if I click on this arrow right here, it's going to open up and it's going to show me all of the um, fields that are within that table. Um, down here I have my measures and then I just start dragging and dropping um, fields onto my shelf for the columns and rows and I make the visualization that you saw um, a couple slides back. So that is basically how you make an ODBC connection in Tableau. Excellent. So we have a walkthrough for those who want to try that. Thank you. And uh, any more questions anyone um, may have? Um, uh, we have a few more minutes, and feel free to to click on the chat box. Um, also, I would like to invite all of you to join the ARLSS group and share their different uh, visualizations you have used over the years. It doesn't have to be uh, done only with Tableau. I think we've had a couple of postings uh, of people using uh, other interesting uh, um, software pieces they found on the Internet. Clearly, Tableau is, is more of an enterprise solution. Uh, but it's not the, the only uh, visualization uh, uh, software. And I think the more we can share different types of visualization, the more adept we will become as a community to sort of um, um, figuring out new ways of, of uh, exploring relationships and um, uh, understanding uh, really more uh, in-depth uh, the, the, the rich, rich, very rich data we have in place. Um, I do have a, a sort of a, a closing type, a type of question. We have talked a lot about organizational data, um, you know, 
all of you being assessment librarians, you know, we, you are tasked to to support, to use data to support organizational decision making. Uh, but there is clearly, um, you know, and one of the early questions um, asked that uh, with the notion of you know offering it as a service to students. But even beyond that, the notion of, of doing uh, uh, of the data management and you know c creating the data specialist. Uh, um, specializations in our libraries. Um, how, do you see uh, this kind of software being utilized with some of the data management service development you are doing in your institutions? And if you don't see it, why not? Is it just a matter of time? I would say yes, um, but I'm um, but I'm not sure that I can speak to how that would happen. But I would think mm -hmm. that it would uh, would be really great for that. And I know a lot of the data management roles are still being defined uh, in our institutions, so there is an evolution there. Um, Jeremy and Sarah. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I have uh, talked a bit with some of the data management folks here about um, whether there's a role for it, and I think the way our our services are structured right now, um, it the kind of benefit that I think Tableau potentially could bring to that data management is helping uh, researchers work more effectively with with taking advantage of the visual element to understand their data. And I think at the moment, um, with the library is not prepared to, to really, um, unless a, a researcher has that knowledge, um, mm -hmm. I don't think the library is equipped right now to be able to teach the Tableau skills to make that happen. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't see it right away, but um, that's, not a, that's not a, I guess I would agree with Rachel that I, I'm not sure exactly how, but if the library sees its role as helping not only to manage and format the data and provide metadata, but also to explore the data, um, then uh, there might be a role in helping develop faculty expertise in the use of tools like this. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, would you like to comment on this aspect? I know it's, it's sort of a, an, the data management services is a, a new area for our institution, so it's evolving. Uh, I've, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've worked with our data management librarian to do a data visualization mm -hmm. workshop for our library staff. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, with um, I, mean, I would love to do workshops for our students, but with all of the other things that um, we're tasked to do right now, I just I can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think it would, you know, my personal opinion is I think um, teaching tools or, or partnering with another unit on campus to teach tools such as Tableau would be a great opportunity for libraries. But again, you have to have the manpower to do it and. Um, you know, the right kind of space and tools and hardware. Um, I'm not sure that we're there yet at Ohio State yet either. Mm -hmm. And again, data visualization means very different things to different people in different mm -hmm. constituencies. So uh, I'm a, you know, a tableau zealot, and I openly admit it. <laughs> but <laughs> it might not be the right tool for someone in another discipline academic discipline. Yeah, different I, disciplines have their own norms. Yes, Jeremy? So if, if, if I may add one thing, then um, I actually thought of this earlier. Um, being aware of how visualization tools like Tableau work with the data um, and how it needs to be formatted in order to work well with tools like that, I think is really important on the research data management side. And I think probably the, the kind of formatting and uh, recommendations that 
a research data management program is making sets people up quite well to be able to apply the visualization tools. But I think being aware of that uh, interface, are there things that we can do to prepare the data in such a way that if people want to um, use visualization tools with it, it's well prepared, um, that I think could go a long way. And I think uh, if anyone's interested in following up a bit on what I mean with that, looking for a Google search for things like how to shape your data for Tableau or how to prepare your data for Tableau um, will give you an idea of things you can do to make the visualization much more intuitive and, and smooth a process. Right. Right. That's really important, but it's also um, um, helpful to remember, too, that one of the beauties of Tableau is that because it allows you to blend data and to um, you know, do things like um, we haven't even mentioned about assigning aliases for your data and um, creating groups for data. So for instance, um, if you have a really messy data set that one time it will say Thompson Library, the full name, and the other time it will just say, um, I, I don't know, like Tomp rather than the full Thompson, an abbreviation. You can actually use um, features in Tableau such as the aliases and the editings and creating of groups so that you can group data of that kind together and just assign it all a new name rather than spending hours um, cleaning Excel spreadsheets with data. Um, another thing that I do um, with um, data that exports really messily to CSV format, um, in, in, and then when you put it in an Excel spreadsheet and it, it just gets the columns all messed up and you spend hours fixing all the columns, et cetera. I now, um, rather than deal with that, I um, just export maybe one or two com fields at a time and, and the one field will be a common unique identifier and then I'll just join all that data back up in um, Tableau and I've just saved myself all of that time from having to um, clean that data. And there's you know, I would like, to, I would love to learn more about data cleaning. So if we could do a, if anyone out there has a, has a you know, a webinar or something, to ideas on data cleaning and fast, automatic ways to clean your data, that would be great. But I, I, um, I use Tableau right now to avoid having to clean some data because of just because of the way I can use the tool, and I find that really, really helpful. Yeah, the the metaphor sort of, uh, I want to close with is uh, a picture from the Minority Report movie where you know the there is the the actor they are working on a transparent uh, glass surface that you know uses his arms to pull different sources of data to combine them to create joints. I mean, this is more of a futuristic science fiction type of environment, but in some ways, this is the kind of, of uh, uh, combining and massaging and cleaning, I mean, of the data that we are doing these days with some of the things you brought uh, to the discussion today. So I really would like to thank all of you, uh, Rachel, Sarah, and Jeremy. Uh, it's been wonderful to have your work captured through these webcasts. And these webcasts will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. And uh, it, we will continue this conversation. Uh, visualization is here to, to rule for the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. <laughs>